So, thank you. I'm JF. I'm Dan. And uh, today we've decided to go with a bit of a theme, uh, kind of a, a, big, a bit of a theme. Try to see if you can spot it during the talk. Um, <clears throat> so, um, we're, we both work on WebAssembly, and uh, WebAssembly is a tale of four browser vendors seeking new languages and capabilities uh, to stay fast and secure on the web. And uh, the old JavaScript wizard really still has a lot of tricks uh, under his belt, but uh, it, it seeks to kind of have a, a, a co-adventure in its you know, virtual machine utopia. And so WebAssembly is really that companion, and we'll talk to you about it today. In this quest, this quest to find WebAssembly, we will adventure through the adventures of MI, machine instructions, the ICEL, trying to figure out how we're going to select our path, and adventure allocation, and many other interesting details as we go along our path. So join us in this quest where you, know, you kind of get to be the hero as well. So to start off our adventure, we have to introduce our character. We have a starting level character. He's starting out, and we're going to give off his character sheet here, as of course you do. Um, the WebAssembly character is starting at level zero. He has a very inexperienced character. Um, he's a virtual machine of sorts. And we say he's neutral good. This sort of uh, ambiguous phrase means that WebAssembly is not indicating a particular purpose. It doesn't say what you can do, what you can't do. It's exposing the bare primitives of, of a platform to let you do whatever you want to do, essentially. And we hope that WebAssembly will be used for good. WebAssembly's strength is the strength of the web, to start with. So this web has over a billion users. Um, and this is really where WebAssembly draws its strength from. WebAssembly's dexterity is its portability. We are designing WebAssembly to be portable across platforms, to run the same program across many platforms. And this is really one of the things that's going to allow it to uh, enable the same program to run in many browsers. WebAssembly's constitution is um, the security of the platform. So the security, the sandboxing, making sure users are safe because we're exposing this thing to the internet. The entire internet is going to be our surface area, so we need to have a very strong constitution. And of course, the intelligence level, finally, of our character sheet is very low. We have essentially zero intelligence because we're starting out from scratch. We're designing WebAssembly to a VR, a very, very simple platform that does very little for you and really gets out of the way and lets you do what you want to do. Right. And um, WebAssembly's wisdom is, is really, you know, it's a bit self-serving, but we're talking about it today, right now. So, so I, some people seem to think it has some amount of wisdom. We'll, you know, we'll let that up to you to judge. And char charisma-wise, uh, it's meant to be of the web. It's meant to be a real part of the internet. And you know, if you look at the original announcement for WebAssembly, it got a lot of attraction, right? So you know, people seem to really love it. So it, it must have some amount of charisma. And so if we go back a bit uh, to the background of our character, uh, it was really born of the union of MScript and SMGS and, and Pinnacle, right? So Dan and I kind of had a lot of background porting some C++ code to the web, and uh, we saw kind of the flaws in this, and we wanted to create a new character to you know, start a new game and really have a lot of fun here and create something that's really, really good. And so it's kind of the cousin of JavaScript. We're not trying to destroy JavaScript. It kind of plays along with it, right? You can still use JavaScript. You can still use C and C++ on the web. That's really the goal of WebAssembly. And uh, really, the godparents of WebAssembly, what really got it started are uh, the Chromium project, Mozilla, uh, the Edge browser, and WebKit. So we have you know, people, engineers from, from the you know, four different browser vendors really working together to make this a thing. Um, and it, in general, if you, if you look, if you, you know, look up WebAssembly on the web. Uh, it, it's developed fully in the open on GitHub, and uh, it, it's you know, kind of formed under the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, to kind of be a lightweight way to kind of go forward and, and evolve this platform in an open way, right? So really, we, you know, browser vendors are participating, but we don't control everything. We welcome a lot of participation from people like you. Um, <clears throat> and in general, you know, as Dan said, uh, we really designed things for, for security. And so our, the armor class for this character is really internet proof, really thick armor. Because you know, we trust developers, we love you, but we can't trust all developers with our users. right? So we really have a big defense and depth approach to what we're trying to make. Um, and uh, initiative-wise, you know, we, we, we got a lot of good traction on the internet. It really kind of surprised us. Uh, so either you know, we, we rolled really high when we went for initiative, or we really have a high stat on this initiative from the start. And then speed-wise, the goal is really to be as close to native as we can. Right? We talk about uh, uh, security a lot. Um, 
which happens to slow us down from time to time, we have extensive experience with making things fast for Pinnacle as well as for uh, Asm.js. We, sh we can show like on, on these platforms that for you know, small micro benchmarks, you can get on par with native speed and sometimes faster for weird effects. Uh, but in general, we think that WebAssembly can be pretty close. It, it, we think that if we do our job right, we can you know, beat Pinnacle and beat Asm.js on the speed aspect of things. Um, and then, in general, you know, langu language-wise, we'll start with C and C++, but we really want this, this platform to be polyglot, right? So uh, we'll talk about that a bit later, but we want to learn a bunch of other languages and allow you to run them on the web as is, right? So no quirks, no anything, just should work. Uh, and as you can see from the talk so far, we're really going for whimsy on the personality traits. Uh, you know, we're trying to have fun with this platform. And um, the ideals that we try to embody uh, it'll sound a bit quirky, but we're going for speed, security, uh, portability, and ephemerality. And if you look at the last three of those, those are really what the web is all about. The web usually is about keeping users secure, making things work anywhere, so it works on your laptop, it works on your mobile device or whatever. And ephemerality is kind of, it's kind of weird to describe, but it's, it's you go to a web page and it's there and you leave and it's not there anymore, right? It's not like installing an app or something like that. It should just kind of work that way. And WebAssembly is really built with that in mind. Uh, and what it adds to that mix is speed, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that a bit more. And then the bonds that we have is, is the real goal is that the web should just be able to do anything that native apps can do, right? So it, it's kind of annoying if you've tried to port to either of our platforms. There's always these weird corner cases and stuff that doesn't really work very well. And, and it's kind of a turnoff to try to, you know, target the web and stuff doesn't really work well. So really we're trying to fix this. And then um, flaws, well, I, usually you put flaws in your character sheet. It'd be kind of silly of us to design flaws into our, our, our little character that's WebAssembly, so we try to avoid that. But in the end, you know, we want to bring the latest and greatest C14 to the web and uh, do that portably and efficiently. And um, one thing to remember is we talk about the web a lot, right, and people roll our, their eyes. We're not just trying to target the web. It just happens to be kind of the thing that's easier for us to do. It's a very kind of good constraint to start a character. But uh, we want this to work as well on, you know, huge high-end servers as well as very small chips, right? So we'll talk about the web mostly, but we, we want to adventure in other lands than just the web. Uh, so, you know, keep that in mind as we go through this. Now, let's dive a bit into the details. Um, so WebAssembly uh, is basically, you know, it has a lot of things built into it. Um, so stop, adventurer. It's yeah. time for our first encounter. Oh, that wasn't scripted at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a real C++ programmer. I use pointers a lot, like real lot. Like I want my memory to work I want cache locality to work. I want to think about pages. Can I do this in WebAssembly? Yeah. So, so I think so. So if you've used other platforms, not Pinnacle and not Asm.js, but it, you know, people are a bit cynical, and pointers should really work, right? Like, you're used to that. Uh, we're not trying to be paternalistic and tell you, thou shall not use pointers, or thou shall not re-reference, dereference uninitialized memory. You can still do that, right? Um, <laughs> if you want. Now, obviously, you know, in our, in our inventory, we, we pull a few tricks to prevent you, if you do something silly, from you know, hurting the user, right? So what we try to do is we try to give you kind of a, 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 a big amount of linear memory, and we, we pull a few tricks to make, make that efficient, but really you can think of that as the same way you would of virtual memory in, in a regular application, right? So, so from a programmer perspective, all you see is effectively, you know, just a big range of memory, and pointers should just work there. Right? Now, it starts off initialized at zero, because you know, why, why would we do something else? But, but you know, linear memory should just work. You should be able to have cache locality. Pointers should work really well. And then you, you, know, you can get function pointers if you want. And, and you know what? If you want, you can even get pointed member functions. Like, we'll put them in there. <laughs> and like, I don't know if anyone's going to use them, but they're there. Right? That should just work. The same thing with vtables, which you know, are used a bit more. Uh, there may be some slight amount of overhead depending on what we're doing, right? We're, we're still looking for ways to expose uh, vtables pretty efficiently and, and be clever, right? There's a lot of kind of security things we can give developers as well as our users. But in general, I think we have a pretty solid inventory. And, and then, okay, so you can call functions and whatever. It's, it's not very useful if all you can do is call functions and, you know, not show anything on the screen or whatever. So in general, in our, you know, kind of bag of holdings, we try to give you a bunch of useful things like APIs. And you know, the web can do stuff. You can draw things on the web. So usually if, if you write a game, for example, you're used to using OpenGL, you're going to use WebGL here instead, and we'll try to provide a bridge that makes that kind of seamless. 
Um, and you know, pretty, pretty soon the web browsers will support GLES3, so it's not kind of a, just a toy language anymore, right? You can do a lot of stuff with that. Um, and the same thing, you know, if you do audio with SDL, for example, you should be able to use web, web audio, it should just work fine. And if you use file systems from C++ or POSIX, that should also just work. The web's not perfect, but it, it's evolving capabilities, and what's great with WebAssembly is um, we're, we're, we're taking some of the stuff the web's not really good at, for example, file systems, it's kind of a crazy land right now, and we're trying to make it more standard and just work so that you know, developers in general don't really have to care about how the guts, the innards really work. Um, and then the same thing for like networking or something like that. We don't want you to you know, start a server on, on just any web page and you know, start sending spam or whatever, but there's some limited amount of stuff that you should be able to do. For example, if you have a game, you should be able to you know, stream things in or, or you know, talk to other characters or something like that. So in general, you know, WebAssembly has a lot of capabilities, I think. All right, so we made it past our first encounter. We gained some experience points. We're really looking for assembly, WebAssembly to really level up um, in a pretty rapid way. So the first version of WebAssembly, we have what we're calling an MVP, which is a very, very basic level functionality. Um, and very quickly after the MVP, we're hoping to add some really great power-ups, like threads with shared memory and atomic operations and locks. And SIMD, um, we're adding a SIMD capability, and uh, dynamic libraries, and zero-cost exception handling mechanisms. That really, we're really going to power up this platform and give it a, a, a good solid base for all the C++ features so we can have a full C++ experience. Yeah. So one of the big themes for WebAssembly is learning from the mistakes that we made in, in both in script and projects and pinnacle projects. And really looking forward to this, uh, building WebAssembly within LVM is one of the big parts of this project. So using, like right now, as, we, as you can see in the tree, we, we're building the LVM backend for WebAssembly in live slash target slash WebAssembly. Um, and you can see all the stuff going in. In fact, you're seeing some mistakes go in, and we're, we're having to fix our mistakes like live in the tree, which is really exciting. Um, this is really great from a practical point of view because, of course, if you've ever maintained an out-of-tree port, it's really annoying. You have to merge upstream change all the time. They break. Um, but it's also really good in terms of visibility, just letting see people what we're doing um, and letting people know that we can communicate and work in the open, and it really is uh, an exciting time. Right, and the, the way we're really developing this, because so if, if you remember, it's under lib slash target, is, is as a virtual ISA. And we'll, we talk a lot about virtual ISA, it's not clear to everyone what that really means. So what we mean when we say that is, on your machine as a developer, you know, it's usually a big beefy x86 box. Sorry for MIPS and ARM people on the, in the room. But it usually is, right? You're a big beefy machine, and, and you develop your code there. And you have no clue which ISA it's actually going to run on when, when you, you know, uh, execute that on the web, right? So your users usually will have you know, a laptop that may have x86 or ARM in it, or a little phone, or a, a phone that has ARM or MIPS in it. And so the virtual ISA really tries to, to um, to embody that, to make it possible within C++ to say, hey, well, the target is going to have these things, right? And so what that means is, is we end up taking some assumptions, right? So the assumptions we end up making are, for example, 8-bit uh, bytes. Like, we're, we are going to assume that bytes are 8 bits. And, and that's, the reason we do this is it's kind of fundamentally ingrained in the programming uh, uh, environment that C++ offers to you, right? Um, you know, size of, size of a pointer is going to be, end up being 32 bits if you opt into that, or 64 bits if you want that. It, it, you, we can't really make it dynamic at the C++ level. Even though your machine may have 64-bit pointers, if you said, well, I just want to use 32-bit pointers, then you're, you're going to be restricted to that 4 gigabyte range. And really, on, on a web page, like, there's very few reasons to use more than 4 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, I, I work on Chrome. Um, so, and if we look at this, uh, you know, we're trying to do these things for virtual ISAs that target different platforms, and we're trying to implement different virtual machines, and because we're on the web, people get really excited, and at this point in time, I think we have about 10 or 11 different implementations of those, those ISAs, right? So LVM generates code, and then there's like 10 or 11 different ways, and it's just people on the internet who created a thing. They're really excited about this. And, and the good news is that three of those, they're, they're not upstream, but three of those uh, are using LVM, right? So we already have three things that take what the LVM target produces sucks it in and targets x86 or ARM or something like that. Now, I don't know if that's super useful, but you know, people are pretty excited about that. And then we make other assumptions. For example, we'll assume, oh, hey, well, you know, you'll have IEEE 754 floating point. That's not always the best assumption. We're still working through it, but I think it'll work out pretty well. And then um, you know, we also have little endian and things like that that we assume. And then 
all these things I mentioned, it, it sounds kind of difficult to stay sane, right? Uh, so what we're, in, what we're doing as well is we're creating a pretty extensive test suite for, uh, for, for WebAssembly, right? So the goal is to say, well, you know, if I do this in my program, does it work well? If I do that, does it work well? So we have a pretty big test suite if you, if you look it up, and we're trying to, you know, really beef it up to make sure that, you know, developers stay sane so that they can execute once and make sure that it pretty works well everywhere. Um, and so we talk about virtual ISAs, and it sounds kind of outlandish, right? Like nobody's really done that before. It's not quite true. If you look in LVM itself, actually, uh, there are things I would qualify as virtual ISAs. There's NVPTX that's already there. There's BPF that exists. There's AMD GPU, and there's the CPV backend. I, I would qualify all of these as virtual ISAs. Now, what we're trying to do is, what's really novel is we're doing everything upstream first. And so that means that uh, we, we, you know, we get to do the mistakes and everything, but we also get to kind of share code with other stuff. A lot of what we've written so far in LVM has been inspired by these backends. And uh, you know, we, we're hoping that, that we get to share some amount of code with them and kind of clean up LVM, right? A lot of stuff that was in LVM before was made with you know, x86 in mind or something like that. And we think we can get a lot of mileage out of collaborating with other people. And the same thing, there were proposals for other virtual ISAs like Spear V or like uh, HSAIL. They didn't quite make it through for kind of other reasons that I won't dive into. But we think that they, they could also benefit, or you know, other virtual ISAs that want to make it into LVM could benefit from some of the work we're doing. Um, and there's kind of the, the, the big demon in the room here, uh, undefined behavior. When you have you know, a virtual ISA, what's going to happen if I do my wild pointer dereference or something like that? Most C++ developers know about undefined behavior. They're afraid they'll like, snatch their children at night or that demons will fly out of the nose. And, and let me reassure you, that's not quite what will happen. So basically, the way we see undefined behavior in WebAssembly is kind of a progressive refinement. Uh, when you run Clang, Clang already decides on a lot of the undefined behavior that C++ would usually give it leeway on. And then LVM further kind of uses some of the undefined behavior for optimizations, but then it kind of progressively refines some of it out. Not all of it, a lot of it's still left, and what WebAssembly ends up doing, it says, it says, okay, well, if you divide by zero, it's just gonna trap. And same thing, if you go out of bounds of your linear memory, it's just gonna trap, right? The same way you would get a seg fault or something like that. So we, we kind of force things to happen in a certain way that's pretty predictable, so you, you, know, you can test on your machine and it'll run the same on your, your, your phone or something like that. Um, there's still some amount of undefined behavior that remains. So, for example, when we support threads, obviously, that, well, it's not obvious, but there's no real way that we found to support threads with, you know, really deterministic execution, but have the speed of threads. And so there is some amount of raciness that can happen with threads, but the way we see it is as kind of limited local non-determinism. So it does mean that on x86 versus ARM, you may see more threads on ARM, but the, if you do see a race and, and the hardware you know, shows it to you, it'll be kind of very limited and very local. So you won't just kind of write at any parts of memory. There's no kind of out of air values that should crop up. That's kind of the goal of what we're doing. And, uh, if you look at the internals of the compiler, and, and by the way, this is me writing instruction selection code in general, table gen. Just kind of pray and hope that it works out. But if you look at what we do, it, it kind of looks the same as any other LLVM backend, right? So we just use Clang, we use the optimization passes, and sure, some of the things are a bit different, like vargs, we may decide to expand early because we decide our own calling convention. Or, you know, a few other things like that, like vtables may have a specific layout or something like that. But in general, everything that WebAssembly does looks the same as, as LVM up to basically instruction selection, right? And that's, I think that's the right way to do things in general. Um, and the reason we can get away with that, that it's pretty easy, is because we're a virtual ISA and we designed our own ISA. And we designed an ISA that's easy to target and easy to generate code for afterwards. Yeah, so if you've looked at the, the table gen files for, say, x86 or ARM, you've seen these really big, complicated, like, multi-class things that are spending multiple lines. In WebAssembly, because we have our own simple ISA, instruction selection is just really simple. This is about a third of our table gen files. You can see, basically, just like, this is the instructions, and it's just essentially, like, listing them out. Because literally every LLVM operation is mapping to a WebAssembly operation, or almost every operation. It's pretty close in many cases. So. Um, this is actually one of the things with, with selection DAG. There's going to be a talk later today about, about a different instruction selection framework. From our perspective, um, we're not actually that interested in which framework it is because all the frameworks give us basically the same thing. We need to have legalization. We need to make sure that the interesting variety of LLVM stuff that can happen with, with strange integer types and, and simile types that we can't support and operations that are sort of exotic um, get legalized by the framework um, and by the same framework that's used for all the targets. So this is the sort of shared infrastructure of LLVM that we're taking advantage of. And for us, it would basically be the same whether you're using selection DAG or a different framework. Today, this framework is selection DAG and LVM, so that's what we're using. 
Um, and you can see that it's, it's pretty easy with the table judge style to just uh, lay it all out like that. So the output of instruction selection is register allocation. Uh, I should say machine instructions, which, which are really all about register allocation. Um, we, of course, LVM does some passes on machine instructions for doing things like LICM and CSE. But this is the pass where we could really start thinking about register pressure. We can really start thinking about the actual machine level constraints. And in WebAssembly, this is also the pass where we start diverging more from what a normal target in LVM would do. Because um, everything up until this, until this point uh, has there's the various target customizations for things like the ABI and for various optimizations. But more or less, it's like it looks like a regular target all the way up to about register allocation. And this is the point where we diverge from a native target because WebAssembly has an infinite virtual register file. Uh, this is sort of a, a platform abstraction because we don't know how many registers the ultimate machine will have. We don't want to hard code a number, so we basically picked an infinite register file, and the WebAssembly engine will be doing register allocation on top of that. So one way to do this would be to take LLVM's existing register file and just directly map everything onto WebAssembly's register file. Um, it turns out that this isn't going to be very efficient because WebAssembly's register file is not in SSA form, and we're doing this because it's actually an optimization for us in WebAssembly. Uh, if you could take two, two SSA registers in LLVM that have non-overlapping life ranges, and you coalesce them into a single register, you're essentially telling the back end, these two live ranges don't overlap. I've already coalesced them. So I can already do some more of the coalescing work that Registrocator does on the developer side of the machine. So that on the client side, when we're trying to compile this into code as quickly as possible to get the application to start up as quickly as possible, we don't have to do quite as much work. In fact, it should be, we actually expect it to be possible to do a fair amount of register allocation on the client side without actually computing liveness, because everything like these, this pre-coalescing has already happened. So we can be able to say, take advantage of that information. So the goal in LVM, on the LVM side of this equation, is we want to be able to reduce the number of registers, and we want to be strategic about which registers we, we join together, because you can make a lot of choices in this area. The most obvious thing is just reduce the total number of registers. Um, but it's an interesting, actually an interesting open research question right now of, of like, what's the best strategy for deciding which registers to color? And it's kind of an area where we're looking for input from other people that have ideas, other people that know a lot about which location. Um, and we're just open, we're gonna talk to a lot of people hopefully, hopefully today and tomorrow about uh, what we can do in this space, what are the opportunities to really maximize optimization and also minimizing the work that needs to get done on the client to generate good code. Right, and so when we try to minimize the work that the client needs to do, uh, we're not just trying to you know, do a lot of the hard work on the LVM side so that, you know, in your browser or something like that, you don't need to do all that much work, right? So coloring is that in that category, but that's not the only thing we try to do. We also try to reduce uh, uh, code size. So the idea here is that, you know, LVM's pretty smart. It can look a lot of code and try to reduce it a lot. And so, for example, when we do the register coloring, uh, it allows us to reduce the amount of references we need to make to other variables, right? So we can kind of order the variables pretty cleverly so that the, the, when we do the compression, it compresses better. But we also do a few more clever things. For example, uh, we, we use something called uh, expression trees. And so an expression tree is basically, you know, you do a few things and the next thing uses the previous thing you've done, right? And so when we end up using expression trees, it means that we don't even need to name the last thing that we, want, that we generated. In a lot of cases, it happens that if you're clever and you tune things pretty well, uh, that compresses much better than, than uh, target independent compression would be able to do. Uh, so, and we, we, we actually do quite a bit more than just that. So as Dan said, um, our, our ISA isn't in, in SSA form anymore, the, the same way LVM has. Uh, we actually use an abstract syntax tree. And the reason we do that isn't you know, totally crazy. Um, the, the idea there is that uh, sometimes we'll want to generate code to, you know, say, say a browser doesn't quite support WebAssembly yet, uh, we could generate code to another language like JavaScript, and, and that's usually a pretty well-structured language. And doing that restructuring uh, is pretty expensive, and size-wise, it, it, it's pretty big. Um, whereas if, if we use an AST, we, we found that it helps us really reduce the amount of code that we ship over the web, right? So the transfer size is much faster. And then on the consumer side, on the browser side, it's not any slower to decode or do anything useful with it compared to a CFG. It allows us to encode some interesting properties as well. And we're, we're also experimenting with things like making statements the same as expressions. So, you know, if you have a loop or something like that, that loop's last iteration is the return value of the loop which is kind of a bit weird, but it seems to work out compression-wise. And we're doing the same thing for like a, if you have an if and an else, that's kind of similar to conditional move, but conditional move ha happens to have more semantically inter interesting information, right? So we're, we're doing kind of a few interesting things that we're experimenting with. And nothing's set in stone yet, but we think we can do a lot of cool stuff here. And here's a, a quick example of what we're doing. Uh, 
right now, th this is like kind of a nice S expression, right? It's like little parentheses and stuff, and it's beautiful. And we could t just take this and like feed it to a Lisp and eval it and everything, and then C++ would just kind of, you know, execute inside the browser and be really beautiful and everything, right? Yeah. Um, yeah? OK, so S expressions, this isn't Lisp, right? Oh, it's not? No. Oh. We're not building Lisp. We're building an assembly language. So hmm. what we're actually going to have LLVM produce actually looks a lot more like an assembly language. I'd like to read this. This is a small text. But you can essentially see, if you're familiar with like, the kind of assembly language LLVM typically produces for a native target, you can see like, instructions. It's like nicely one instruction per line. It does have a very simple one step at a time kind of language. There are basic blocks. There's registers that are being declared. So this is really the, essentially, the, because we're all compiler writers, and we understand there's to be different syntaxes for the same language. In the LVM world, we can think of this machine essentially being a linear sequence machine with basic blocks and with, with a very assembly-like na nature. Um, this is actually really great for working with things like MC and related tools, because we can just really use, like, one of these instructions is an MC inst, and everything kind of maps naturally. So this is kind of our, we have two ways of looking at everything. There's the sort of S expression, AST world, and the assembly world, and they basically transport, to, they correspond. Yeah, so of course, well, most developers don't really want to write assembly code, though, right? So, so you know, if, if all you have is assembly code and you can target the web, that's cool, but how, how, like, you shall not pass type of thing, right? Like, what, what happens? How do I generate that assembly code? You use a front end. Oh, that's genius. <laughs> genius. <laughs> all right, so um, we're obviously looking at C and C++ as very important languages, and, and within the Elven community, Clang is obviously that front end. Um, Clang gives us very great C and C++ support, and for the most part, we're just using Clang as is. All the functionality, we don't need to change anything, because in the back end, we have a, a complete sort of C++ platform. All the stuff in Clang just works. Um, that said, there is some interesting stuff we can do within Clang. The most interesting part is the C++ ABI. So the Itanium ABI for C++ has been around for several years, and it's, it's held up pretty well over time, but there have been some people talking about things that we can do to improve on the Itanium C++ ABI. And these are things that existing platforms can't always do because you get an ABI and you have to stick with it forever. WebAssembly is a new platform, does not have an ABI yet. So we're actually still at the point where we can decide new cool things we can do in the ABI. Um, there's been some talk about C++ ABI v2 features, and there's some interesting ideas. Some of those are developed in the context of ARM64, which was also in this position recently. Um, so we're actually right now sort of soliciting ideas for like what are new cool things we can do in C++ with the ABI that, that haven't been possible before or haven't been interesting before because machines can't change their ABI. That's kind of an open and interesting question. Right, so the, there are a bunch of kind of interesting ideas around C++ ABI v2 from, from you know, how you represent things to how you do guard variables or something like that. And we're also thinking about not just ABI level things, but how, you know, how do we represent function pointers efficiently so that, you know, okay, we're securing the user, but how can, you, how can we help developers secure their code, right? So if you write a game, it crashes, you may not care all that much, it's a bit annoying, but if you're a bank and you're targeting the web or our platform and it crashes, that may be bad, right? So, We'd like to try to figure out how we can enforce things like CFI optionally, right? So you can opt into having these things into your code and, and really reducing the overheads when that happens. Uh, you know, maybe we want to do stronger type checking or you know, play with the vtables or something like that, but neither of us are really C++ ABI experts. So one of the reasons we're here today is, you know, try to have, us jo have you join our party and, and, you know, adventure with us in this land of optimization. Um, so, you know, First, we're developing, uh, uh, we're developing WebAssembly as a C++ platform, but uh, not to be distasteful, we're first using LVM, but we'd like other, um, other compilers to also kind of join the fray here, right? So I, I may say a bad word and say GCC, but it'd be cool if GCC really targeted WebAssembly as well. Um, because really, our goal is to have really good tooling, right? We're not, we're not doing this for LVM's sake. LVM's a great tool for, for that, but really the goal is to have developers use this and be able to do really cool stuff on the web. And so the tooling that we're trying to develop should be pretty much what you're used to, right? Uh, if, if you've used tooling to target the web today, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't feel very familiar as a developer, right? You can't just fire up your editor, write some code, run your unit tests and stuff. It doesn't quite work the way you expect it. Um, and so we really hope that you know, people get kind of excited and, and make their tools support what we're doing really well. Yeah, tools, debuggers, sanitizers, profilers, code coverage. These are things that C++ developers depend on on all the other platforms. And we want our platform to be a first-class C++ platform, including these tools. So these are things that we're looking at building, um, in many cases using the existing infrastructure and just porting them to WebAssembly, just like you would port them to any other platform.
Right, so as I mentioned before, we're looking to very quickly power up WebAssembly from the sort of very basic MVP minimum level to add threads and SIMD and dynamic linking and zero cost DH. Um, but we're hoping to do more than that. I mean, you really can't achieve excellence in the space of programming languages if you just support C and C++, right? Right, so you have to kind of find some new magical artifacts to play with. And, and some of the stuff we're trying to do is we're also trying to port languages like Rust or Go or C Sharp or Python to our platform. They, they should work really well and not just like in a tiny interpreter that, that you know, is slow, except, well, Python, because C Python. But um, other languages should work really, really well and really, really fast. And actually, you know, I, I kind of, of, you know, took a dig at Python, but PyPy should work in our platform, right? So JIT compilation should just work, right? That's one of the big things that we, we think should be true inside of WebAssembly. Security-wise, it's kind of difficult to make comp JIT compilation work really well. And portability-wise, it's also very difficult, right? If you look at PyPy or LuaJIT, uh, they're used to jitting code to x86 or to ARM. And, and uh, doing that for WebAssembly, we obviously won't be just consuming x86 and executing it. That'd be kind of silly. It kind of defeats the purpose of having a JIT compiler. So what we'd like to be able to do instead is, is present WebAssembly as you know, a virtual ISA that PyPy or, or LuaJIT are able to target. And that means that we can pull a lot of cl clever tricks within the browser to optimize things, but also means that developers you know, can run, say, QAMU inside their browser or Valgrind or something like that. That should just work, right? Um, and and, and you know, that kind of links to what we do with dynamic linking. If you think about it, dynamic linking is you know, loading new things into your address space and executing it. That, that's kind of the heavyweight, slow version of, of, of JIT compilation. Uh, like, you should be able to run LLVM inside your browser and just compile things. Like, we can do that today, but it's not really efficient. It's kind of slow. And then we're trying to add a lot of new features. For example, gar garbage collection. That I think right now, nothing really prevents you from compiling the BOEM GC into your C++ application and using that. But that only goes so far. We'd like it to be able to, for example, write a Go or a C Sharp application that has references to outside objects, objects outside of the WebAssembly platform, maybe to other WebAssembly processes, or maybe to something in JavaScript that puts something on the screen or something like that. And garbage collection throughout those, those vats is still kind of an open research problem. Uh, I'm sure many PhDs can be done doing that stuff. Now, we have a lot of other things that we're looking in, into. For example, we want to expose uh, fine-grained memory control so you can, you know, and protect your, your, your memory ranges or something like that. That'd be kind of interesting. Uh, we want to allow you to support signals. There's a lot of clever things you can do with signals that you can't do today in a lot of platforms. And, you know, we want to make basically everything that you're doing today in your C++ ap application possible. Now, our adventure at this point is kind of back to the tavern, enjoying a good brew, and we're trying to figure out where our ne next quests are. We have very basic things running today. If you look at you know, LVM-generated code, we can run it inside the, the VHL or something like that. We can write FizzBuzz to the screen, add numbers together, things like that. That's pretty exciting. But we have a lot of stuff ahead of us, and that's really where you know, we, we'd like to invite other people to, to you know, kind of play with us here. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right. All right, thank you. Okay, so we have time for questions, and there's a mic in the aisle over here, and I have another mic which I use on the other side of the room. Um, feel free to come up and, and ask any questions you have. And I'm gonna start with one. Um, so, Pinnacle, try to do many things, some of which you're also trying to do, including allow native code to run in browsers. But, and they had a very strong security story, partly because they actually have a verified uh, code generator and they put s significant restrictions on what kind of code is allowed to be generated from the front ends. Um, can you say a little bit more about how, you, how you're trying to achieve the same thing? Because getting the level of sandboxing and security that they get and still be efficient is, is not easy to do. Right, so um, Pinnacle you know, used native client, uh, NACL, as the sandboxing mechanism. And, mm -hmm. and as yeah. far as we know from the Chrome perspective, you know, we have a vulner vulnerability reward program and stuff like that. As far as we know, it's never really been broken as a sandbox. It's been used as a stepping stone, but there's never any bugs found that allow people to get an exploit. So, we're not killing native client is one of the things. Uh, you know, I'm not here to pip native client on this, this platform here, but uh, it's, it's still a thing. We're still working on it. And so nothing prevents uh, uh, WebAssembly from targeting native client. Now, the original work we're doing is within the JavaScript engine. And the reason we're doing that is it's a pretty small, nimble, and efficient JIT. It, it compiles code really quickly. And 
we think we can improve the security of the JavaScript engine. Uh, I actually had a talk about that at CppCon a few weeks ago. And, and the reason we think we can improve it is because a lot of the code that we have within WebAssembly right now is very static, right? If you look at JavaScript, it's really hard to track object types and stuff like that. And that's where exploits end up happening, uh, as, long, as, as well as you know, some race conditions and stuff like that. But um, a lot of the things we learned from native client, we can apply to what we're doing for WebAssembly. And at the same time, we don't want to impose the security model onto the platform. So what that means is, is, you know, Mozilla may do something slightly different than what Google uh, Chrome ends up doing, right? So we kind of try, we'll want to experiment there. Yep. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I think one of the challenges with virtual ISAs is getting really good cross-platform performance. Uh, I'm talking about code quality, not compile time performance. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my question is, what sort of things are you designing into WebAssembly to make it easier to produce, I guess I would say, simple um, backend compilers that convert WebAssembly to native code so that you don't need to write you know, a full-blown huge compiler with a complicated scheduler and register allocator and all those other things just to get really good native performance out of WebAssembly? Yeah, so I think we mentioned earlier that um, using the essentially LVM's register allocation framework to do pre-coalescing on the, on the developer side to do, in order to allow uh, efficient, um, high quality register allocation on the, on the client side. Um, we're also seeing implementations take a two-tier strategy where in order to get the page up and running quickly, uh, because the web experience is you click on the link, you want them on the page, they have a very fast JIT that generates sort of medium quality code. Um, but because WebAssembly is being designed to be very low level, it's one of its uh, Strengths here is very low level. Uh, a very simple JIT can get generate fairly decent code. Like we've seen within two or three X of native in some cases of a very, very minimal JIT from WebAssembly to machine code because it's very low level. Um, and then in the background, having a heavier weight JIT, something that can do a lot more optimization, do a fancier instruction selection, particularly on like x86 where you have to do all the pattern matching to get the x86 um, essentially CISC instructions um, in the background and then swap that new compiling, uh, the new compiled code in when it's ready. So you can sort of start out your application, it runs fairly well, but once we have enough of the code, enough of the optimization done, we can swap the fast code in from a heavier weight JIT in, is sort of one of our strategies. Um, another strategy is, I guess, just mentioned uh, making WebAssembly low level and building in really low level uh, aids. So load and store instructions can have a built-in constant offset. This is not just a separate add, it's actually a constant offset that's built into the load. And with the way we can do sandboxing, um, which is, not something we're going into detail right now, but the way we do sandboxing, this constant offset actually can be folded directly into the immediate field of like an x86 add. So we can, we can do some of these things on the developer side to form these loads with constant offsets that will essentially translate directly down to, and this is what's happening in the instruction on the client side. So we're, we're giving ourselves some, some nice goodies to help out with that. Right, and there's, there's similar work that we can do, for example, for, uh, for vectorization, right? So if your machine has four wide or, or eight wide SMD or something like that, you may want to use it differently. And, and we think that there's kind of interesting things to be done there as well. Uh, so for, you know, kind of not auto vectorization, but all the heavyweight stuff can be pre-computed and then used on the, the browser side or just completely ignored and scalarized instead if the browser doesn't do it. Other questions? And so you talked about JIT compilation. I was wondering what the status is, right? So I work on Julia. We target LLVM. Mm -hmm. You have the back end, like how, like, are you in a state where I could just run it and try to JIT it, or should I wait a year and try again next year? What's, what's the status? Yeah, so in the, in the MVP of, of WebAssembly, sort of this very, very first version that's gonna come out, we don't have the JIT capability in that yet. So the JIT capability is gonna be something we're gonna add on, so it's not gonna be there right away. But the story is, like, yeah, you're using LLVM. Um, you can actually compile LLVM if you wanna do like true JITing, you can be running LLVM within WebAssembly, generating WebAssembly code on the browser and then handing that WebAssembly code off to the underlying engine for actually final translation to machine code. So we can have the sort of full actual JIT situation going on. Thank you. Don't all rush the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask a question about threads. So you said that you, that you don't have a good solution yet for how to uh, get deterministic results with <laughs> with threads and actually I think trying to get deterministic results is probably not the right goal anyway because there's lots of code that is perfectly fine to be non-deterministic as long as it's data race free. Yep. But 
are you interested in giving any kind of guarantees for multi-threaded code? Are you interested in any kind of safety properties or safety net for that code, even within the sandbox? Yes, yeah, so the model we're exploring is kind of a very low-level model. It's somewhat similar to the C++ one. Uh, we're, what we're thinking about now, and it's not you know, fully gel yet, but uh, we're thinking about having something along the lines of, of relax, acquire, release, and, and sequentially consistent load and source with uh, some form of few text support as well. And that would be kind of the basic building blocks that you can use to build something on top of it. Now, that model uh, relies on data race freedom for, to, to guarantee uh, uh, that you know, your, your program executes as, as you expect it. But um, we think that you can build kind of your own tooling on top. So we talked about, say, sanitizers. You, you could just run the sanitizers on top of your stuff if you want to. Now, the sanitizers themselves have a certain cost. Right? So our goal is to kind of try to offer you the right basic abstractions to target you know, the, the, the final ISA uh, without any overheads, and then you can you know, build some tooling on top to do that. Go ahead. Uh, so you kind of glossed over Indianness, so I wanted to go back to that. How, you said uh, WebASM is little Indian, so how does it, is it you're just going to force that, uh, how are you going to do that uh, on big Indian chips? So. <laughs> Uh, WebAssembly is a little Indian platform. Um, big Indian chips can do an explicit B swap after lo every load and store if they want to implement WebAssembly semantics. Uh, so you mentioned the BOEM GC as a something that you want to run on your platform. What oh. about precise <laughs> garbage collection? Uh, are you planning to provide a garbage collector that other managed languages would plug into so that WebAssembly will handle the garbage collection? Or are you trying to provide primitives so that everybody can implement their own garbage collector in WebAssembly, I guess? Right, so the, the BOEM GC isn't something that I specifically want to run. Uh, it, it's like a pointer to member function. It's, it's possible to use it, but like, you know, I, I don't really care if you use it or not, right? So the, the idea is, is we give you the base capabilities to make it usable. And then if you want to use the BOEM GC, you can. Now, the precise GCs is, is where it gets really interesting because it's not just about, you know, it, there's no real point for us to expose a precise GC within the virtual machine without really giving uh, uh, full control to the developer. So some of it is being able to do stack inspection, really see where you've spilled things, where your things are. And once we do that, really, we, we'd like to be able to expose some of the capabilities outside of the WebAssembly VM, right? You should be able to run, say, two or three WebAssembly processes, and they can have cross-references, maybe some, some circular references or something like that, and should still keep working, right? So this is a really high-level idea that we have. We think there's something there that can be done, uh, um, but we're not clear exactly on how that's going to happen yet, right? So it's still, it's still kind of in the future. Right now, we're trying to build the kind of bare bones basic platform that allows developers to do useful things and then kind of ship feature after feature. And GC is one of those big things that like, you know, we, we won't ship in the first version. Okay, so I think uh, we're ending right on time. We uh, have a five minute break before the next talk to give people time to, to choose whether they want to stay in this room or go to the other room for the other parallel talk. The talk in this room is the one on global instruction selection. And the one in the other room, I believe, is on input space splitting for OpenCL. With that, I'd like to give the speaker a hand. The speaker's a hand, actually. <laughs>